Dr. Sarbani Basu is the chair of the astronomy department at the University. Uh, I started to go through her bio, but it scrolls and scrolls and scrolls, and I can't remember all that. So suffice it to say, she is a luminary in solar astronomy. Uh, last year, she was awarded the George Ellery Hill Prize. So, a big deal. Please welcome Dr. Sarbani Basu. Ten-ish years ago, I don't quite remember. It's been a while. So, what I would like to talk to you about is how do we actually figure out what happens inside the sun? So, if you take a photograph of the sun, you saw one measly-looking uh, active region or sunspot right now, but there are times when the sun is much more active, which is what the background image shows. So the sun shows a cyclical behavior, the number of sunspots go up and down. So these are UV images taken by the Solar and Heliospheric Observatory, SOHO as we call it. And uh, the number of sunspots go up and down and we have a long record of these sunspots. So that's the famous or infamous Mondo Minimum where there were no sunspots seen. Uh, people used to think that maybe the solar cycle didn't actually work during that time. These days we believe that the solar cycle continued, but it was so weak that you didn't produce sunspots. It's a slight subtlety. <coughs> and then you can see that the, uh, the level of sunspots, the height of the sunspot maximum sometimes is very large, sometimes it isn't. And question is what? Now after I prepared that slide, NASA released this stunning photograph. This is 20 years, 22, 22 years, 20, 22, anyway, 1996 to 2017 of the sun. And you can see in the beginning, 1996, when SOHO was launched, the sun was very quiet. It was the minimum before solar cycle 23. <coughs> The solar maximum of cycle 23, lots and lots of sunspots. Now these are images in UV, so the sun actually appears brighter and than a white light image. So sunspots are more dramatic when you see them in UV or x-rays. Then the very deep minimum, and then the maximum again, and we are slowly headed towards the minimum. There's a bit of a debate in the community whether we have actually reached minimum or not. But, I mean, the sun is very quiet. You just saw one. You can barely see one sunspot, if you like. Now, why do I bother about this? Or why should you bother about this? <laughs> other than that you get very pretty pictures. <laughs> one of the things that happens is the sun ejects lots and lots of particles towards us. So you see this big ejection here. That's called a coronal mass ejection. So what I'm showing here is that the main disk of the sun has been covered, has been baffled. That white ring shows what the radius of the sun is. So, we, so this instrument called LASCO, it covers twice that size so that you can actually see the corona, which is not very bright. And these events, unfortunately, can have really unfortunate effects on it. So, let's get back to, so what happens when you have the effects of solar cycle? Now, fortunately for us, it's not life that is threatened, but unfortunately for us, it's technology. Because the first time people realize that the sun can <coughs> affect how we live, how we work, was in 1859, the so-called Carrington event, which was a humongous solar flare, and telegraph wires started, started shorting. This was, that was the height of technology those days, telegraph. Telegraph operators got shocks. So, so that was the first effect on technology. Uh, and the thing is, the Carrington event, as it's known, 
it's actually a very, very big deal. Uh, we don't have this very often, fortunately. It's believed that such an event, that if it comes towards the Earth today, would, could cause trillions of dollars of damage, unless you turn off your satellites and make sure your power is off. But there is evidence that there have been events like this before. And after all, the sun is a four and a half billion year old star. We've only been observing the sun superficially for about 400 years, in detail for less than 60 years, when it comes to really good observations. So as it turns out, ice core samples retain the signatures of such big flares. So we do have ice core evidence of solar cycles and you know, large cycles, small cycles, going back to a few thousand years. <coughs> so we're lucky in that way. What are they capturing? Uh, the beryllium to, <coughs> and the uh, beryllium. So what happens is you get uh, the solar particles hitting the atmosphere, creating particles. Uh, it's the beryllium to, sorry, um, I'm blanking out, the beryllium to something ratio that you look at. And you can see the solar cycle in that. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. Isn't the creation of beryllium? Uh, I think it's an isotopic ratio more than anything okay. that they look at. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm blacking out because it's not really my field, so, but it's so interesting. It's spallation in the atmosphere. It's spallation in the atmosphere, and that gives the trace. So. Okay, now just to scare you a bit, <laughs> what can happen today? Okay, we don't have telegraph wires, but we have things like GPS satellites. We have communication satellites. Uh, we have power grids, and remember, wires in a moving magnetic field can produce extra electricity. So in the late 1980s, the entire northern Canada got blacked out because of one of these sudden storms. So the, the, the economic effects of such a thing is going to be really, really bad, which is why we want to be able to predict it. These. But to be able to predict these, we want to know what causes them. So uh, when I was last year, I was looking through literature as to what happens, what could happen to uh, commerce and society on such a thing. I came across an interesting article in the um, Space Weather Journal, which came out in 2016, which talked about a near nuclear war that happened in May 1967. The data were declassified a few years ago, so which is what we know of. And this is in May 67, there was a solar storm. And what had happened is that all the US Air Force's radars in the northern polar regions, they started getting noise and they thought it's Russians jamming them. And so the US Air Force was on red alert. Fortunately for us, by that time the US Air Force had started a space weather group. And they did manage to convince the powers that be that this is not the Russians doing anything. This is actually um, the sun creating havoc. So since then, the Air Force has actually put in a lot of money into space weather study because you do not want all <coughs> And there was another event during the Vietnam War when underwater mines suddenly started exploding. And again, that was solar events causing a geomagnetic storm, and these were magnetically triggered mines. So, <laughs> <laughs> so wow. Well, so, the problem, the problem is we cannot predict these events. We do not yet know the exact details of how these events occur. And actually, the problem is even more basic. We can't even predict the strength of a solar cycle. You saw the figure where I showed that um, some solar cycles are stronger than others, some are very weak. And we can't even predict that yet. In fact, for cycle 24, 
So before the beginning of cycle 24, NASA had launched a competition, well, not quite a competition, but yeah, think of it that way, uh, had asked people who study selectivity to predict through various models, some of them had very sophisticated models with data simulation techniques and all of that, what the strength of cycle 24 would be. Um, they were all over the place. So yeah, of course, by chance, there were two models that proved to be right. So it's the cycle 25 predictions which show if those two models really were right by accident or whether they really, uh, I mean, they're really correct. So we'll have to wait for another five or six years to know the answer to that. But that, uh, this exercise to predict cycle 25 has already been, is actually ongoing right now. So you'll know soon. So my approach then has been, okay, this is a tough question. We don't know how to predict the solar cycle. But we know that ultimately the solar cycle has to be caused by something inside the sun. So what is happening inside the sun that we can detect, that we can correlate with magnetic activity, so that we can try and figure out, do we monitor the inside of the sun, so predict the outside, or just get an idea of how the solar activity cycle works? And given that my training was more astronomy and physics, I decided to look inside. So what I do, we try to determine, what does this solar interior look like? That's actually, turns out, once you have the data, a pretty easy job. The second, do processes in the solar interior show magnetic activity dependence? That is much more interesting, much more finicky, and I'll show you some results for that. But, okay, but before we can look at changes inside the sun, we need to know what the base interior looks like. You know, what's, what does the sun look like inside? Perhaps as complicated as this. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that would be really, really hard to do. <laughs> so the question is, how do we go about it? So we know stars are opaque. You look at the sun, you can see this is during, uh, this is even quieter than what it is today. It's not a single sunspot. Look at it in another wavelength. It's not the same day, unfortunately. It's still opaque. Look at it very carefully, like the images that you had shown. You see structure that you don't see inside the sun. So how do we see inside the sun? Now, that's a problem which has actually plagued people from the beginning of stellar astrophysics. One of the person who's often called the father of stellar astrophysics is Sir Arthur Eddington, the same Eddington who took the, for the, uh, the expedition. And he had written one of the first textbooks on how you could determine stellar structure. And in the first paragraph, he laments that our telescopes may probe farther and farther into the depths of space, but how can we ever obtain certain knowledge of what is being hidden behind the substantial barrier of the sun? Of the sun? What appliance can peer through the outer layers of a star and test what lies within? The backdrop is a flyby through the Hubble Reef deep field. So indeed, we can see farther and farther. So the question is, what do we do to see inside the sun? Is there an appliance to look inside? And as it happens, there is. So the tool we call asteroseismology, the seismology of stars, if you're just talking about the sun, we call it helioseismology, seismology of the sun. And that actually allows us to go deep inside and figure out why. Think of our geophysicists, what do they do? Whenever there's an earthquake, they use that to probe what's happening inside. Because if you have an earthquake there, after a few hours, you would see the signal somewhere else. And that tells you how long the disturbance took to go inside the earth and can give you what's going on inside the earth. We do it slightly differently, but we can, I'll come to that. 
So, the sun, like most stars, they're, they're made of gas. And, fortunately for us, uh, and these, because it's made of gas, they pulsate. Oh, can I see the view of depth here? Why isn't this pulsating? Should be presenting. Sorry, this doesn't seem to be working. I'm getting that up. There it goes. Okay, let's try again. Mm -hmm. ah, there. So that is a sonification of the sun's pulsation. The sun pulsates with periods of about five minutes, so we can't hear them. So the period has just been jacked up. The frequency has been jacked up. So it basically sounds like noise. But if you decompose the noise, you get many, many, many tones and overtones. And that's what we use. So, question is, how can we observe sound across empty space? Of course, sound needs <coughs> material. But we don't look at the sound. We look at the effect of sound on the surface. It's like seeing a drum <coughs> that's being played. The surface of the drum gets distorted. We look at those distortions. Now, because the sun is so close by, we can see the entire disk of the sun, and we can measure the velocity, the speed at which any part of the sun goes up and down, up and down, up and down. And we use the Doppler effect to do that. So we take the spectrum of the sun and see how much the light is shifted, and we take an image every minute. Actually, current best the spacecraft mission that does this for the sun takes an image every 45 seconds. And that gives us a velocity image of the sun. Okay. And we also do it from the ground. So this is the so-called Global Oscillation Network Group. It's a network of six solar telescopes, tiny telescopes. They're about an inch and a half in diameter. You don't need too many photons. It's white light. <laughs> uh, spread across the world because you want to get continuous data. Whenever you're talking about frequencies and periodic phenomena, gaps in the data are bad. They introduce artifacts. So we try to be as continuous as possible. GONE has, at its best, obtained a duty cycle of up to 85 to 90%, which is very good. Because, of course, on Earth, weather is a problem. Then there were the two spacecrafts. There was the Solar and Heliospheric Observatory, SOHO. That had a number of, that has a number of heliosismic instruments. The main one actually has been switched off because a bigger, better version of it was flown on the Solar Dynamics Observatory. So NDI took about a solar cycle worth of data and then HMI, the Helioseismic and Magnetic Imager, on Solar Dynamics Observatory to go over. Now, why is it that we can use these pulsations to study the sun? It's just that different frequencies penetrate to different depths in the sun. And we can actually, through some very neat but simple theory, connect the structure of the sun to these pulsation frequencies. So, if we had a model of the sun, we could calculate its frequencies. Or if we had the frequencies, we could work back to figure out the structure. Not just the structure, but also the dynamics, the rotation of the sun inside and other types of flows. And all thanks to the fact that sun waves penetrate just close to the surface, other goes deep, so you're actually scanning the entire sun. It's a good thing this doesn't happen on the Earth, because we'd be constantly... <coughs> but with the sun, it's a ball of gas, so it's easy. So what have we learned so far? Uh, for those of you who know stellar structure, please forgive the next few slides, but otherwise. <coughs> so what we've learned is that the outer 30% of the sun is what we call a convection zone. That is a mass of boiling, churning plasma, constantly moving. It's like boiling water. You heat the water at the bottom, it starts boiling and coming up, gives off the heat at the top, comes down again. 
So that's what happens in the outer 30%. The inner part, the heat of plasma, is actually stable. It's not moving. Uh, heat is transported in the inner part through radiation. So it's just the way solar heat comes to us, the radiation. This is convection. And we know the boundary very, very precisely indeed. When I say 30%, I'm actually not being very precise. This layer is at 0 0.713 times the solar radius, plus or minus 0 0.001. Wow. So, wow. yes, yes. Helioseismology can do that. But, yeah. When you say it's 30% is, is plasma, does that mean... No, it's all plasma. 30% is boiling plasma, <laughs> meaning it's moving, <laughs> it's roiling, it's convecting. Okay. In a part, the plasma is stable. Is that due to differences in pressure? Uh, no, it's actually differences in temperature and how opaque the material is. Opaque the material is, because if gas becomes very opaque at a given temperature, you cannot conduct heat by radiation. There's a maximum uh, difference in temperature that a substance can sort of support without before becoming convective. So that's what happens. So very uh, low mass stars, stars that are say 0.75 times the mass of the sun, they're convective all the way throughout because they're so cool that they're very opaque. Very high mass stars are usually radiated, except in the core, but there the convection is because of a different reason. So, <coughs> so what the difference in temperature between like a stable magma inside and the outer Okay, plane. so the temperature actually changes monotonically. It's not the temperature that matters, but the gradient of the temperature that matters. Every material has a maximum temperature gradient, that is, how much does the temperature change in a given region mm -hmm. that it can sustain before becoming convective. So the center of the sun, as I'll show you in a few minutes, is about 15 million Kelvin. The surface is 57-ish thousand, 5,700 Kelvin. It's cooler. Oh, much cooler, yes. Yes. Is that boundary stable? This one? Yes. Seems to be. I've been trying to see if there's a change with solar cycle. I mean, by stable, I only have 22 years of data. <laughs> <laughs> the boundary does change with the evolution of the sun. So yes, a billion years ago it was at a different point. A billion years from now it will be at a different point. I'm thinking of short. That's not about stars in the sun. I can tell you what the sun will be like a billion years from today. I can't tell you what it will be like next year. <laughs> because the short time scale phenomena are controlled by these surface magnetic fields and stuff. The long time scale phenomena are just basic physics, nuclear reactions, and gas pressure. So. So this churning, boiling, we can actually see that at the surface. This is the Whoa. solar surface, uh, seen from the Swedish vacuum telescope on Tenerife in the Canary Islands. Uh, at the time this image was taken, this had the best seeing of all solar telescopes. This has now been surpassed by the Goody Solar Telescope at the Big Bear Solar Observatory. So that you can see the these are the chops of the churning material. Cool. So what have we found from UBS seismology? The internal <coughs> structure of the sun is almost exactly what we ex expected it to be. So in that sense, it verified our theory, but it was also boring because you don't learn anything unless you see a deviation from models. <laughs> The structure of our models and the sun, they deviate only by fractions of a percent. So, yeah, well. So what do we know? The temperature of the solar core is 15 million Kelvin. So I can actually tell you the temperature of the solar core better than many geophysicists can tell you what the temperature of the Earth's core is. <laughs> but I'm being unfair, the Earth's core is metals, the Earth's mantle is rock, so to find the temperature is much harder Gases are simple, and it's almost a perfect gas when we talk about these temperatures. 
there are deviations, but it's almost perfect, guys, and we all learn mm -hmm. the Poyce laws and Charles's law in school. For the most part, they apply here, so things are easy. What else do we know? The core of the sun is extremely dense. It's about 13 point something times denser than land. But of course, it's so high in temperature that it's not a solid like lead, it's still a fluid, it's gas. This is 15 million Kelvin, 27 million Fahrenheit. So, so this was very reassuring that we could actually model the sun from first principles, from simple physics principles. You have a ball of gas, gravity is trying to collapse it, but because it's gas and there's nuclear reactions happening inside, it heats the gas, gas pressure works outside, and the entire life of a star is a battle between inner gravity and outward pressure. Sometimes gravity wins and the star <coughs> contracts, sometimes pressure wins and the star expands. But simple physics principles tell us we, are allowed, we can model the star very well. We saw that with the sun. The surprise this came is when we started looking at the rotation of the sun. Now, solar rotation was discovered pretty early on once uh, Galileo saw sunspots, which of course upset many people because the sun was supposed to be perfect. And Shiner was actually a Jesuit priest who took it upon himself to record sunspots, and he hoped that he could show that the sunspots were actually clouds over the sun. <laughs> But he has meticulous, he had meticulous pinhole camera uh, drawings of sunspots. There are copies of this book in a few university libraries. I believe Yale has one, I know Stanford has one, I've seen the Stanford one, I haven't seen the Yale one. It's called Rosa Ocina, See the Soul. And the thing about this observations was if you look at his images one day after the other, you can see the sun rotating. And not just the sun rotating, you can figure out the angle of inclination because the sun is not straight, uh, it's not perpendicular to the ecliptic. There's a seven degree tilt. And those observations can actually tell you that. You can get a hint of that diagram. Now, we know from looking, so this image, I don't know if these lights allow you to see it, you see these sunspots going over the surface, so you can actually figure out solar rotation. And people had done, looked at traces like this to see solar rotation, and what they had found is that the equator rotates much faster than the higher latitudes. So people had tried to model that, to say, how could you have that <coughs> using simple equations of fluid dynamics? And they came up with that if you want to explain the solar surface observations, you want to model the solar rotation as though there were cylinders inside the sun, each cylinder rotating at a different rate. So if you drew lines of constant rotation, they'll be parallel to the rotation axis. <coughs> now, that is not what Helios seismology showed. What Helios seismology showed is that the surface rotation rate continues to the base of the convection zone. That's the division where the churning mass becomes a quiet mass of gas. Almost to that. You can see there's a bit of a difference. But it doesn't look anything like this. And we still cannot model that properly. We still do not know how to model that properly. You can look in this, at this in more detail. So instead of looking at it this way, I could show you cuts of the rotation rate at different latitudes. Okay. When you say you can't model it, you mean you can't explain it? <coughs> with, yes, exactly. We cannot start with basic physics principles and put in ingredients to get that picture. The way we did for structure, for structure we started with very basic principles we got a structure that matched the structure of the sun. We cannot do that for dynamics. Yeah. 
So if I take cuts of the rotation rate at different latitudes, I get a picture which looks like this. So it's back the equator there, I think the lowest one is 75 degrees. So at the equator, the outer layers rotate faster than the inner layers. At high latitudes, the outer layers rotate slower than the inner layers. And you see this layer, this is known as in the field as the tachocline meaning a region where speed changes rapidly. And this is where people believe the solar dynamo resides. Okay. That's a hypothesis. And there's another layer which is of interest, yet no one really knows its role. And, oops. and that is that layer of the surface, you see the rotation rate increases slightly inward. So the maximum rotation of the sun isn't at the surface, but at about 2% of the in, inwards. Mm -hmm. We call this the near surface shear layer. There are hypotheses that this layer could also support a dynamo. Uh, we don't know. We really don't know what's going on. So the mystery is about it. What do you mean dynamo? A dynamo would be the mechanism so remember, the solar magnetic field increases and decreases. So you need a dynamo to generate the magnetic field and to kill off the magnetic field by some process and to generate it all over again. So that's a dynamo. Mm -hmm. but, but Sorry? Well, yeah, in a sense. But there is still a question of how do you start with the magnetic field, which is basically donut-shaped, make it into a magnetic field which is of a different shape. Again, recreate the donut shape to make it into the normal the sort of magnetic field we are all used to, like a bar of so, yeah. Just for a sense of perspective, could you repeat again how far down that is? And could you, could you tell us also how, how far down do the sunspot holes go? That's a very good question, and we do not know how far down the sunspots go. We are trying to find that. And they go at least to a few megameters down the surface. We don't know view of that. A megameter is a thousand kilometers, so a million meters. But so for perspective, the radius of the sun is 700 megameters, roughly. So that's a good number to remember. That the first demarcation, what I call the type of line, that's at 0.7 of the solar radius. So there's 30% of the sun outside, 30% inside that. While the near surface shear layer is only, it's about 2% of the sun. And most people would say that the sunspots definitely do not go deeper than that. Right, right. Yeah. And that's what I was wondering, yeah. the relationship between the near surface shear layer and the, the surface Yeah, spot. and, and the, the problem is the near surface shear layer, as we see it, is much deeper than what we've been able to measure as the depth of the sunspots. Okay. But measuring the depth of the sunspots is tricky. It's tricky because pulsations are sound waves. Sunspots are magnetically active things, and sound waves, when you pass them through magnetic fields, do strange things. So we don't quite know how to interpret the results. So. <coughs> so how do I study solar cycle with these frequencies? Well, the frequencies change with solar cycle. Nice thing. So what I show here, forget about what all these things are. So this is basically the difference in pulsation frequencies between the Cycle 23 maximum, so cycle 23 maximum minus cycle 23 minimum. The difference plotted as the frequency at the cycle 23 maximum. Okay. So you can see that there's a difference in frequencies. This is not zero. And I can actually take an average of this difference and plot it as a function of time, which I do in the insert panel. And I'll show you a movie in a minute, and you'll, show, you'll see that these frequency differences follow the solar cycle exactly. So, see there? So the, as the cycle increases, the 
differences in frames, you reach the maximum of cycle 23, you're not going down. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Almost a zero, wouldn't it? Yeah, that's maximum. It was the solar minimum. In other words, the solar cycle is encoded in this. <coughs> now, after, despite looking very carefully, we don't see any difference in structure. And that's not surprising. The sun is quite dense, and for magnetic fields to make a difference to the structure, they'd have to be very strong. Magnetic fields have pressure, so to make difference to the structure, the pressure due to magnetic fields have to be a reasonable fraction of the gas pressure. So inside the sun, the gas dominates the magnetic fields. However, outside the sun, it's the magnetic fields that dominate the gas. So we don't see any structure, but dynamics is a different matter. We see changes in solar dynamics. And I'll show you a movie next. Let me explain to you what the movie is. It's solar rotation. I've taken I found the solar rotation through two solar cycles, averaged it, and I've subtracted the average from the rotation at any given time. <coughs> and you'll see patterns of red and blue. Red are flows that are in the direction of the solar rotation. Blue are in the retrograde direction. And the patterns migrate as the cycle progresses. So, 1996, look at the red thing. It will migrate. I'll play it again. So between 1996 and 2001, you'll see the red blob migrate towards the equator. We normally, it's very difficult to understand what's going on if you look at a figure like this. So what we normally do is make a plot at a given depth, instead of showing all the depths, as a function of latitude and time. If we do that, we get an image which looks like this. Butterfly. Yes, exactly. That's where the butterfly magnetic fields lie. Yeah. That's where the sunspots lie. In these migrating flows. Yeah. Awesome. yeah. Whoa. Yes. Now, this actually, this figure has taken us quite a while to come by because the first figure we found looked like, see what happens here, you have these lanes going, the active belt lanes going towards the equator, and then there are these flows going towards the poles at the high latitudes, and both cycles, this is cycle 23, that's cycle 24. When people first did this, they didn't see the forward flow of cycle 24, and that's when these speculations came out in press that we won't have a solar cycle 25 and that we're going to have the under minimum. The problem is, to get this, we are subtracting the average rotation rate. And it turns out that the rotation rate inside the average rotation rate of cycle 23 was different from that of cycle 24. This is cycle 23 minus cycle 24. So at different latitudes, the thing was different. So, which is why we had to go back and subtract only the cycle 24 average from the cycle 24 data, and you see those forward lanes. Yes, they're very weak, which means cycle 25 will be probably as weak as cycle 24. But they're there, so we will have a cycle 25. Because these flows actually show the beginning of the next cycle. That and you see this band? This begins before the end of the previous solar cycle mm -hmm. okay. and continues on. So there's cycle 25. Mm -hmm. so. Okay, now the very large pink areas to the poles in the in 24. They were very strong flows. We don't have those in cycle 24. In tw that's 23, that's 24. And that's, that's what surprised us. That we knew there were cycle to cycle differences, but this was a large difference. 
Um, we'll another half century before we really figure all this out. You need, I mean, that's the problem. It's not a cycle. I mean, an average astronomer will have a career which is roughly three solar cycles. We've, we've only had such detailed data since 1995. Detailed data is detailed <coughs> the year so that we can do this sort of stuff. And Is there any other country that's doing this? Oh, the GONG is actually a collaborate. It's mainly funded by the NSF, but the stations are in very different countries, and each station is maintained by the country where it is. SOHO was a European and a NASA joint mission. So that's international. Yeah. Uh, SDO was mainly NASA, but a lot of the expertise came from our European colleagues. Europe, um, Europe will launch a mission called Solar Orbiter very soon, which is going to measure, measure magnetic fields and do a bit of helioseismology from a slightly different vantage point. Because we're always looking at the sun from the ecliptic. So we can't really look at the solar poles. We don't really know what's going on at the solar poles. <coughs> I'm hoping that we're going to be as interesting as what we see in Jupiter or Saturn. Oh, yeah. You know, the whirlpools or the Sa Saturn's hexagonal shape to vortex. Yeah. But we have no way of knowing it right now. Well, we have missions, so we're not that happy. No, they but they didn't do that. <coughs> yes. They were they particle were very missions. Old. Yes, yeah. Ulysses was a particle mission. It measured solar wind particles. So, yeah. Yeah. so yeah, if we're not careful, we don't see it. and. The interesting thing is, these differences actually are seen very deep inside the sun. So remember the tachycline I talked about. This is the tachycline from observation, that's a model of the tachycline. And we can use the observations to see if this jump changed with time. Indeed it does. It's the change in cycle 23. The colored points are the jump <coughs> in rotation rate. Doesn't matter, don't worry about the units. Think of it as the jump in rotation rate. The gray background with the axis on the other side is the sunspot number. Cycle 23, the jump followed the sunspot number. Cycle 24, no. So the deep seated changes inside the sun which we don't understand. This is these are very recent results. They're still being peer-reviewed and waiting to see what the referees say. I can translate the sort of number into changes at different latitudes. That's what the equator looks like. That's at 45 degrees. That's at 60 degrees. So cycle 23 and cycle 24 don't look anything like each other. So I personally want to be very surprised if we see this pattern repeating every 22 years rather than yeah. mm -hmm. if it's a hail cycle related thing rather than a solar cycle related thing. But two more cycles. I think that will happen before I retire. But yeah, I have to remain active and healthy. But yeah. So the thing is, of course, the sun is one star at one given time. And we need other stars to put the sun in context. And thanks to missions, space-borne missions, we can actually do seismology of other stars. Not in as much detail as the sun, but still, we can do it. Instead of, for the sun, for example, we've seen millions and a couple of million frequencies. For other stars, we get about 50 to 70 because many of them are averaged out because we see a dot of light instead of the full surface. But the idea is this. For other stars, we used to have a very hard time to measure the radius and the mass. If you had a binary star, you could measure the mass. But for a single field star, you couldn't. Or given, astroseismology actually allows you to do that quite easily. And the analogy I would do is put musical instruments, larger stars, Pulsate in lower zones than smaller ones. So a tuba. Oh, 
So what about real stars? So these are sonifications of real stars. Now, Kepler, so KIC stands for Kepler Input Catalog. Now, Kepler and the spacecraft actually looked at a fairly obscure part of the sky because it didn't want to be contaminated by very bright stars. So there are some bright stars in the Kepler field, like Peter Segni and Ara Lyra, but uh, most of them don't have names, just telephone numbers. <laughs> so these are sonifications. So we've taken the taken the data from the star, converted that into a sound wave. Okay. And we've done use the same multiplicative factor in all of them so that you can see the difference in frequencies. So this was done by one of my students. So this is a star about the size of the sun. High pitched. Oops. This is about one and a half times the size of the sun. This is, if I can play it, apparently not. Three times the size of the sun. And this is a red giant, nine times the size of the sun. So, my personal favorite is a white dwarf. <laughs> it fades um, in and out like that? Sorry? It fades in and out like that? Uh, I think that's an artifact of the sonification. Oh. The one that fades in and out is this. This is a binary. You can dance to this. That's why. Yeah. <laughs> so, how do we observe pulsations in other stars? Well, we have to go above the atmosphere. And the first mission which died last week was most which stands for microvariability and oscillations in stars. Anyway, we call it the Humble Space Telescope. It's literally, it was the size of a suitcase. Now, it's PI, Jamie Matthews from the University of Vancouver in Canada, was um, actually displeased the Canadian Space Agency bosses by calling it the Humble Space Telescope. But the next <laughs> it's, it's either that or SpongeBob, so one of those. Then came the uh, French mission called Corot, which stands for convection and rotation in stars. Now, Corot, at Corot was proposed to be an astroseismology satellite, but it wasn't funded. So the planet search people said, "No, we want to plan search planets with this." So it had to change its observing strategy. So it observed a number of stars, but it wasn't really as successful as it could have been. It also lost a couple of its CCDs very early on the mission, but it showed some really good results, particularly for red giants. Kepler, of course, changed the field completely. So most of us who do stellar astrophysics say this was the best stellar astrophysics mission that has ever been launched. Yeah, so the um, Kepler PI, the Baruki, in the first few years of Kepler, it used to really annoy him to hear us say that, but I think by the end of the mission, he agreed, because the number of papers on stellar astrophysics far outnumbered the exoplanet papers. <coughs> but that's a different story. And now we have TESS. TESS has started giving data. It's been observing for about six months now. We are just about beginning to get science out of TESS. It's not as good as Kepler when it comes to seismology, unfortunately, but you take any data we get. What have we learned? Now, structure looks like, again, like in the case of the sun, we are not going to learn anything new. However, just like the solar case, telerotation is proving to be a problem. So I'll talk about just one problem here, which is the fact that, that as a star evolves, its core shrinks and its outer, layer, the outer layers expand. So you expect the core to spin up. Just like you would say for an ice skater who would you know, bring her hands in. Okay. Now, so what you expect is 
is if you plot the core rotation in days, how long does it, how many days it takes for the core to rotate, as a function of size, for larger cores, you would have slow rotation, that many days per rotation. Smaller cores, you'd have uh, larger rotation rates, so fewer days per rotation. That should be the size of the arrow. What we see instead is the arrow seems to go up. <laughs> yes. And you got more than one population. Yeah, so these are two different types of red giants. <coughs> this is a normal red giant which has a helium core which is not does not have nuclear reactions. The, those are red giants where the helium core has started helium in there, he, uh, helium nuclear, helium burning, helium fusion. So we call them red clump stars, or horizontal branch stars, depending on the metal, how much metal they have. So yes, so then mysteries abound. If anybody's a good theorist, you're welcome to come and help us. <laughs> So I'm going to end here, just put in the generic slide here that we can hear and see what goes on inside the sun and other stars. And we're discovering really interesting phenomena, which we do not quite understand how they happen, which of course is very good news for the next generation of astrophysicists because they will have a job. <laughs> but, I came to this from trying to understand solar activity, and as you can see, we're still a ways off from that. Thank you for your attention. So, a missing gap. Okay. So, when we're looking at other stars, yes. uh, how are we getting to the seismology? What is the data link? The data <coughs> is for other stars, we look at the brightness variation. Okay, so you're looking at variability. Yes. Okay. Yeah, Over but the short. variability, we are talking not like classical, not, don't think of Cepheids and our lyrids. Their, their brightness varies by factors of many, many magnitudes sometimes. For the sun, for sun-like stars, it's parts per million. Uh, for subgiants, it's a hundred, hundred-ish parts per million. Red giants, it's a couple of thousand parts per million. And the time scale? The time scale for the sun, it's five minutes. You can scale that. So we're red giants, it's hours. Okay, so Kepler was observing once every was it 14 minutes? So Kepler, for most of the stars, was observing once every 30 minutes. But for a subsample of about 540 stars, it was observing every one minute. Mm -hmm. Which is why we could do the other stars. It had a data downlink issue. I mean, there's so much data, it didn't have onboard compression, and it had to use the deep space network, which is always expensive, so. Yeah. It's an interesting field, and we've piggybacked on the exoplanet people. But hey, we make a mission which we can use, we use it. Yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> was the, the prediction of rotation rate based on, on uh, stellar size based on conservation of angular momentum? Yes, it was. So basically, there's some other, and there are obviously <coughs> some angular momentum transfer mechanisms which we are not aware of. Yeah. Probably magnetic fields again. Anytime we don't understand something about the star, it doesn't What else? Yeah. I mean, that's the only thing one can really think of in this case. Yes. You mentioned that maybe there's going to be a mission looking at the poles. Well, uh, there's uh, the European Solar Orbiter, which has, which is going to be next year or year after. I'm forgetting the date. That's going to be slightly off ecliptic, so it'll have, it'll observe the poles for about 10 minutes. Now, NASA is bringing out an uh, announcement of opportunity for a mid-scale solar mission, heliospheric mission. So some of us are hoping to propose something which could look at the poles. But then I'm not an engineer. I can give the science cases. So. But that's how a mission works. You gather a lot of people. 
Will the uh, Parker Solar Probe help with any of your data? No, and research no. Parker Solar Probe is a very different type of probe. So that's actually going to make measurements of the magnetic fields, of the particles, of the electric fields <coughs> at the surface of the sun, mm -hmm. or very close to the surface of the sun, a few million miles, which is the surface of the sun. Right. Uh, it's not going to look at the entire sun and look at its spot section. So yes, it'll give us data about the magnetic fields, but not the sort of data I'm using. <laughs> That's okay. It's still a very exciting mission. It's amazing. I, w I must say, I drew a blank on something you said, and okay. I, I may have dug it out of my head. But I just want to confirm the, the 22 year hail, hail cycle. cycle. That's the, the magnetic flip. That's the thing. magnetic. So you go from north <coughs> to south, back to north again at any given point. Right. Yes. It took yeah. me a while to break, yeah. get that back. Yeah. Yeah. It is that understood? Uh, it's an observation. I mean, it's an observation. No, no, no. We don't understand solar activity at all. So that's the problem. <laughs> the dynamo, no, <coughs> the dynamo models do predict the large scale behavior. Okay. That they can show that a certain combination of magnetic fields and rotation can do a solar cycle like behavior. And some, you get. Depending on the rotation and the strength of the magnetic field, you could get a lovely periodic phenomena, or you could even get a chaotic phenomena, depending on your parameter space. The problem is they do not predict any of the smaller scale stuff which actually matter in terms of effects on Earth. So yes, they can explain. They'll get beautiful butterfly diagrams. They can do that. They can see polarity. But some of the things, like how does the magnetic, how do you start the magnetic cycle? They have to put in assumptions. And what sets the period that they have to set in assumptions? Did I get that strong? I have a real dumb question. What is a sunspot? What is it really? What, why so a sunspot is basically a very strong magnetic field, localized magnetic field. It looks dark because it doesn't let convection transport heat up. Another reason it's dark is magnetic fields have pressure. The gases have pressure. And you need a certain total pressure to defy gravity. Since magnetic fields have pressure, gas pressure in those regions can be lower than the surrounding regions. Low gas pressure means low temperature, which is why they're darker. So sunspots are not really black. They just look black by contrast. Yeah. So these are just bundles of strong magnetic what, fields. What's the difference in temperature? Uh, I believe the sunspots, the, many of them have 4,500 Kelvin rather than 5,700 Kelvin. Yeah, but the brightness goes as two to the fourth. So that's why the contrast is pretty high. So their disturbances, um, rather, they're not affecting us. Like, they're not guns that are shooting. At they, all no, some of them are, think of them as guns that are shooting, except that the sun is a nice ball, and not all of them are directed towards us. Not all sunspots will flare and emit things. But some of the bigger ones will. Right. So there could have been Carrington events, but they never hit us. Uh, yeah. There's been some close calls. There have been some close calls, yeah. yes. But uh, yeah, we've been very lucky so far. And yeah, no, you don't want one of them. I mean, that's one of the reasons that the Soho spacecraft, even though it was launched in 1995, it's still kept on. It works reasonably well, despite these many years. It's sitting at L1. So any proton and electron event, it detects first, and then sends the signal back by EM, electromagnetic waves, so we do get some warning. So one of this was the Halloween flare of 2003, I believe, when uh, Soho did warn that there's going to be a direct hit. Um, most satellites were put in protective mode, except one Japanese TV satellite, which tried. <laughs> <laughs> and the interesting thing that happened though was the Congress at that point was actually 
uh, trying to cut funding. This is a measly amount of funding, I think $2 million per year or something, for one of the monitoring stations on Earth. The flare happened and that died down. Two million dollars a year, you wanted with the earth in general? Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs>